Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to talk on this subject in Jerusalem. Uh, my research first started with uh, a long essay about the first half of the 20th century painters in Jerusalem. And then I began my research about the liberation artists, beginning with the artists in Beirut. Um, I'm going to first establish two thoughts before I start the description of the liberation movement. And also I'm going to give you a reason why I call them the liberation artists. Uh, the first thing I want to establish uh, is that I'm talking about a narrow period of time in the Palestinian part. Uh, and that being from approximately 1970 to 1995. I might be showing specific artists, some later works by specific artists. My talk is not about art, the artists themselves, but about the movement as a whole. The other thing I want to establish is that I'm talking about painting and sculpture. There's one sculptor that I will present, but my expertise is in painting, and I'm talking about painting, not installation art, or video, or any of the other mixed media, which deserve their own treatment. Uh, paintings, by definition, are on a flat surface. That flat surface could be curved, but the flat surface has an image on it, which creates an illusion of things we experience in the world, historically from the beginning of time. And historically, from the beginning of time, the image and that uh, coexisted from cave painting when there were uh, images of animals that people hunted and ate uh, to marks that mark date perhaps or days passing to the present time when we have a computer with pictures in them and uh, words. Painting is important in social in human civilization. It's not going to disappear because it's fashionable to do installation art or is fashionable to do conceptual art. In human culture, in civilization, the flat image is very important because it's movable. We move it into newspapers, in the computer, we carry it in our pockets. There are millions upon millions all over the world of pictures, calendars, anything, cartoons, a teenager draws a doodle on their tennis shoes, they're all pictures, and these pictures hold language, they communicate. And pictures are of many different kinds. There are areas of picture making which are research, and areas which are practical. Perspective grew out of painting. It started 2,000 years ago, and then became perspective in the Renaissance, and now it's uh, uh, a virtual reality. At its base is the geometry created by perspective, which was born in painting. The words we use as letters we use were born in painting. So a lot is born in painting, and the research edge of painting is important. It's not going to go away because some critics talk about what's wrong with it. The next thing I want to establish, which is a little harder to establish, and I want to do it with pictures, is that the art we know that is called Western, beginning with Impressionism, is not the art of the bourgeoisie. It's not Western art. It's the art of working class revolution. And it begins with the Impressionists. The Impressionists are painters that are loved worldwide by everybody. It's a phenomenon. It's an incredible phenomenon. For the first time in history, we have paintings that do not praise the bourgeoisie and their actions. We don't find rich ladies and satins, you know, standing in uh, effete poses uh, as uh, decorations for rich men. Uh, we don't find the activities of rich men. We find more the middle class in these pictures. We find light and luminosity. And uh, we find also the general. I would be grateful if someone would push the button for me. Uh, and I'm unable to... Uh, Einstein and uh, his theory of relativity and we have Cubist talking about 
time in painting and drawing. Um, uh, you saw uh, Monet, the Rouen Cathedral, the various uh, versions of it. You could see the focus on light, on environment, on luminosity, on the general rather than the particular in art. Thanks to the uh, incredible optimism released by working class revolution. Next, I'll get out of the way now. Next, you will see a painting by Brock, uh, with, uh, uh, an example of cubism. And you see the cubist trying to describe time by drawing things from many different points of view. Uh, next, and so now we move to the Soviet Revolution. The so first attempt at Soviet Revolution was 1905, which did not succeed. And you take note that it influenced Europe and the Cubists were about that time. Uh, in in uh, 1917, the Soviet Revolution, no question that was a huge working class revolution. Uh, new ideas emanated. There were artists who were ex excited by the revolution and some were not, of course. The art made by those excited by the revolution is what we do remember. The rest went with the trash heap of history. So backwardness means you're in the trash heap of history. So here we have Malievich, and the reason I'm showing you for Malievich is because uh, you will see that artists are taken up by a working class revolution. They get very excited by it, as they were during our our own resistance movement, both in Beirut and in, in uh, uh, historic Palestine. Uh, and here we have Malievich at the beginning of his life during his early years doing an Impressionist painting. Then he moved ahead into the Cubist with the uh, land tiller on the, the woodcutter on the right. Uh, next to, uh, we see Malievich getting to the height of the revolution with, these painting, with this painting on the left which is totally abstract, the first abstraction in, uh, in history uh, with four-dimensional ideas. Of course, the truly first abstraction in history was Islamic Arabic art during the feudalist uh, centuries. And then we see, as the revolutionary impulse began to recede, we see Malievich receding with the revolution, going back to three-dimensional illusion. Now, I'm not saying three-dimensional illusion is bad, but it's been researched, thanks to Leonardo and all of the uh, artists that followed. We have complete knowledge of how to do illusion, how to do shading, how to compose an image, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're repeating it, it's okay. It makes a beautiful painting. Not everybody has to be at the edge of research. You know, sometimes we need uh, art that illustrates, let's say for medical reasons or for children's books. We need illustration, we need uh, all kinds of drawings for practical production of things that feed us and house us, that are invented in painting. But meanwhile, painting can't stand still, it has to move forward. So for me, abstraction is the, the most uh, recent movement. Now, why am I telling you about all this? Because, next one, because I feel that the uh, Palestinian movement the Palestinian uh, movement during the 70s, 80s, and early 90s was one of the last movements, revolutionary movements of the 20th century. A very important movement uh, that resembles a great deal the Mexican mural movement during the 40s, 30s, and 40s. And this is an example by Diego Ribeiro. And if you look carefully at it, he is representing the same kind of subject matter that our artists during the Intifada and during the revolution in Beirut were representing. They're representing work and they're representing the, the difficulties of work. You think of uh, uh, Sliman Mansour and the, uh, uh, what's the title of the painting? He's carrying the Hamel al uh, Hamel al Atal, couldn't help me. Thank you. Uh, next, and so this, there was a movement, it's not abstraction, but it's, not, it's definitely not Renaissance, Renaissance type art. So I'm giving you a view into the history of art, so, and I'm telling you that I disagree with the Western interpretation that Impressionism is Western, that abstraction is Western, uh, that, uh, that is abstraction is modern and now we create postmodernism. 
take note of the propaganda, postmodern, they don't like modernism anymore, they've got to push it down and create what is in their, uh, I, uh, in their th thoughts, in their kind of thinking. And now you might question me about that and maybe I make a quick explanation. Uh, postmodernism mostly has a very reactionary subject matter when practiced by Western uh, 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 citizens, but in a world like ours, artists are more interested in the politics that dominates their life, and they tend to put more advanced subject matter using that mixed media of postmodernism, but they do get focused on words instead of pictures. And, and that is outside my, the realm of my work. And the next working class movement uh, is an American one, and it is abstract expressionism, and most of the painters were leftists, and it was the time of the industrial union movement. There's a tendency to just say America and cancel it out, but there's a working class in America, and the inspirations they created were deeply moving to the artists of the abstract expressionist, never mind that the US government used them uh, as propaganda against Europe. Uh, next, so these things I want to establish. Now our art, our Palestinian art, I am saying that it is one of the last revolutionary movements of the 20th century. I've listed all of them, and I'm going to show you the relationship between all of them. So I view it not as, oh, we Palestine, and uh, it put us in a drawer by ourselves, like a subcategory of some kind. I view it as its proper place in international history, and that's where I'm placing it. And that's why I'm saying it's not the individual artist that's important, it's the movement that's important. And the movement is inspired by an upheaval from the ground, a groundswell that gets everybody excited. When I started interviewing the artists of the, uh, in Beirut and the artists of the Intifada in the West Bank, it had, they had been completely changed by the Intifada. Sleiman Mansour told me, I used to think a painting could change the world. After the Intifada came, I could see nothing that could be stronger than the Intifada. And, and uh, so artists rise with the, with the movement and sometimes they recede, but the influence stays. Sleiman is one of the most amazing Palestinian painters of that period. I have deep respect for all of them. And also during in Beirut, the movement was many artists. So many people don't want to say Muna Saudi is a Palestinian, but do remember that these borders between us are Sykes-Pico borders, they're not ours. So Muna Saudi has relatives who live in Gaza and in Bilgur also, and so she was part of the movement in Beirut. And this is sculpture by her, dates from the late 60s, and you can see it is not influenced by Western art, it is influenced more by ancient Egyptian art. The influences on the art, Palestinian artists were several. The Mexican mural movement, the art of uh, revolution that happened throughout the 20th century, uh, uh, the ancients of our own lands, uh, uh, and I will list them, but if you compare Muna Saudi to the uh, sculpture on the right, you see that Muna is concerned with a kind of classic representation of the image. Uh, there it is, uh, uh, she is overtly squarish. There is a side, a front, a back. You can walk around it and enjoy it, but it has the same kind of frontality from all points of view as the ancient Egyptians. Now I'm gonna show the same uh, sculpture again uh, along with uh, a, 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 a small clay models by Rodin. And they demonstrate the ideas that first started with Michelangelo about what sculpture should do properly. And if you look carefully, you see that the, the optimum of sculptural accomplishment for Western and European sculpture was to lead you around in a spiral around the figure. Uh, it did not stop at a face. It tried its best to lead you. This one takes you in a figure eight. You go up, you come down, you come back the down the leg, you go back up again, and there's another spiral up the other arm. 
And, and so you can see the Michelangelo-esque, the Renaissance ideology of what a sculpture looked like, and Muna Saudi looks nothing like that. Next. So now I'm showing Mustafa Al-Hallaj, and these were artists who were uh, uh, active in Beirut. Now Beirut, the uh, uprising in Beirut was definitely a working class war, a uh, class war between those who ruled and those who were uh, workers, and it was very strong. It was not as American propaganda represented it, a religious war, forget that idea. A propaganda only fills our, tries to fill our head with divide and conquer. Uh, and you see Mustafa Al-Hallaj, an amazing artist, influenced by ancient art, not only of Egypt in telling a long story, a long row after row, but also influenced by the negative, positive understanding of space that we see in ancient Egyptian art, and especially in Arabic calligraphy. Uh, the consideration of the space between a figure and a figure, that is the empty space, Designing that space, as well as you design the black space, is super important. It's, it takes a, a lot of understanding. When you're drawing, you're not drawing the object itself. Your mind has to split. You're drawing the object and what's around the object. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a very weak result. And you look at Mustafa al-Hallaj, and you look at ancient Egyptian, you also see the linear storytelling. And that piece by Mustafa, nearly 100 meters, he, he himself told me personally, he titles it, self-portrait as man, God, and devil. Next. So you see the one, I don't know which one that is. This could be the God, uh, uh, but it resembles Mustafa. So this is a part of that long uh, piece, which dates, of course, after 1995, but not by much. Next. And we have Abdul Rahman al muzayyan from Beirut, who also moved to Ramallah recently. We have the poster on the left showing the, the power of unity and collective action. There's an image quite similar in Sikiros, which I couldn't find to compare to it, but it's good. If you compare something not too similar, you have a more powerful uh, 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 argument. You see David Sikiros, uh, and on the right, clearly saying that it's the many working collectively and in unison who win a revolution. So here I'm showing the influence of the Mexican mural movement on our movement. Next. And uh, finally, also, I want to show three Nabil Ananis, uh, all, only because he's demonstrating some of the ideas, and I love all of them equally, uh, some appeal more than others, but I'm being uneven in who I represent. Uh, there was a difference between the revolutionary movement in Beirut and the Intifada. There's a difference in the kind of symbols they used. Both were a symbolist movement, very much like the Mexican mural movement. Uh, and both were resting on uh, workers that had recently become workers that had been uh, peasants before they were workers, farmers, peasants, muzari'in. Uh, and you see here the, the influence not only of the Mexicans with Diego Rivera on the right, the flower seller, and Nabil Anani on the left, motherhood, but you also see the influence of uh, Arabic abstraction, uh, what is called symmetry, but symmetry done in a very special way, organized in very special ways, that you see in public buildings, or even on the Sheish Beish, the inlaid marble, uh, the inlaid wood and mother of pearl, you definitely see it on the Dome of the Rock outside, inside, amazing pieces, and you see it in Aqsa. Um, and what I'm talking about here is the fitting of shapes. So uh, Nabil is fitting parts with each other, if you look at the children between the, in the mother's arm, he's squaring off the arm, he's doing everything, distorting so shapes fit shapes, the very same way they do in symmetrical patterns. Next. So uh, again, Nabil Anani on the left and uh, Vermeer on the right. And you can see the difference. 
Uh, if I ask you who is Nabil Anani more like, Diego Ribeiro or Vermeer, obviously the answer is going to be Diego Ribeiro. Uh, so you see him fitting shapes again. So uh, in a very interesting way, which I will talk about, which resembles inlaid uh, mother of pearl, inlaid marble, inlaid uh, uh, glass in, in plaster of Paris, which is typical of, of our public buildings. So you see them working in all of these ways which have nothing to do with European art or its history. But I'm not saying that there isn't a European influence. Nabil Anani resents uh, uh, shading, doesn't like shading. He thinks of it as old fashioned and he's right. So next, but sometimes we shade for other reasons, but that's Nabil Anani. And here we have a piece by Nabil called Solidarity. And you see there's no negative or positive. All shapes are negative positive. Every shape has equal parts of, uh, of uh, 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 pushing out uh, and pushing in. So they kind of move next to each other very much like a group of people who are totally in harmony. And if you look at the piece on the right, symmetry, a, a panel from the Dome of the Rock, uh, it faces you on first entering, and you look at the white and the dark, the dark being red and black, and you look at the white, and you see an amazing understanding of negative positive space, something that is rare and very special. You also see that it's not wallpaper that continues by the yard, as many uh, architects of the present time do, thinking they're being very Arab, because they never did that historically. It was always one cell, of the, of the pattern, or one and a half, or three, there was always a very careful uh, arrangement of what's inside the shape with the shape itself. And moreover, these panels acted as a choir with other panels that were calligraphic or floral. Uh, next. And now we have uh, Sliman Mansour, who explains this painting uh, as being a UN relief. Uh, here is a woman who just lost her home and everything, her livelihood, her family, and all she receives from the UN to make up for it is a, one loaf on her lap. And uh, then he paints the uh, 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 pyramids on the way to Egypt. He's obviously using the Christian metaphor. And he, he mentions that they look like tents. Um, and on the right, I have Diego Ribeiro again uh, to remind you of the kind of shape fitting with it, but that both the Mexicans and the Palestinians have. You see how she's holding the baby, how her head is, how her hair, uh, her headpiece is, the, the horizontality of it, the rendition into simplification, geometric simplification that you do not see in naturalistic Renaissance art or later art. Next, and I want to show uh, Sliman Mansour with another working class movement in the USA. This is by Ben Shan, and Ben Shan during the 30s and 40s when there was a really strong working class movement and uh, was painting, this is called The Unemployed, and on the left you see Sliman Mansour simplifying, abstract, geometricizing the shapes and talking in a symbolist way. You see a, 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 a farmer or a, a tiller of the earth. You see his robe has become olive trees. This kind of symbolizing of mixing shapes together is very, very particular to the intifada artists, very unusual. Uh, the difference between the intifada and the artists in Beirut is the artists in Beirut were part of a movement that intended to gain peace through war. Uh, it was an armed movement and the, the gun was always present and often present with a dove, thinking we'll get to peace but we have to liberate the land. When you get to the Intifada, that's not what is being said. What is being said is we do it through peaceful means. Next. Oh, I think that's the last one. No, there's one more. Uh, what I'm showing here is another very interesting phenomena of the artists of the Intifada that I have taken note of. Uh, in, in the piece by Vera Tamari on the left, I'm sorry I don't have the title and date, but an early piece, and Mahmoud Taha on the, on the right, Jerusalem, 
uh, you see them working very influenced by inlaid work. Uh, that is, they're making the parts, then combining the parts, and then if the outline of the result, once they get happy with the result, if the outline of the result is not a rectangle, then they accept it. This is the work. It doesn't have to be in a rectangle. We don't see the world through uh, a window as European art sees it. It could be a container of some other kind. But in this case, Mahmoud Taha just leaves it free. Uh, a Vera, it's fairly free, but she frames it. But you see the freedom to be outside the frame, inside the frame, etc. And so uh, if you have questions, that's what all I have to say. I think it is, was, it, it, it is an amazing movement of Palestinian artists that should be remembered by the young, uh, should be studied by the young, and uh, I'm really sad that this history isn't present in, and taught to everybody who wants to study art because I think it is a supremely important movement and all respect to these artists. Thank you. And other than there could be there, you know, it it's rife with symbolism, the art of the Intifada and the art in Beirut. Symbols, the symbols were used. Symbols were used to speak to the people. They were not speaking to outsiders. They were not speaking to the critics. And I'm glad you asked the question because you brought up an important point up in my mind. The artists in Beirut did not have an administrative layer telling them what to do. It was a revolutionary period, and they did everything. Ismail Shammut wrote the history book. They did a little museum. Uh, they did galleries. They, they helped each other study art. Uh, anybody who... Uh, by mistake let them know that they had put brush to canvas. They carried them off and said, we'll educate you. They sent them to the Soviet Union, to East Germany, to have them study art. So there was a collectivism uh, and an enthusiasm that I've never seen anywhere else. Uh, and it happens, I've, I've read about it in other movements. Now what I think is symbolized by this fitting of shape, especially in Nabil Anani, is the idea of solidarity. That is, we, what I lack, you would do, and what I do, you can lack. So we're working together, it's the togetherness idea. Uh, and it's people in, in that piece, it's people of many different shapes and sizes and so on. I showed it to a friend who's a leftist in New York and she immediately says, that's just like what it should be in a committee working to, of people working together. We all have talents and we all contribute them and, and we, we share contributing them. So what I'm good at, someone else may not be. Uh, yeah? And then there's the, the Samia Halabi who was walking and organizing demonstrations and meetings. <coughs> And she makes very political posters. <coughs> Thank you. And they're very strong. I'm not shy to say whatever I think. The most recent two posters were that I held in a, the last demonstration. Well, one said, uh, want peace, dismantle Israel disarm its army, and the other one said, uh, Israel makes Auschwitz in Gaza. And I remember standing at the edge of the, the police always puts us in a corral like animals, and we can't move or go, sometimes they're nastier than other times. And, uh, and it, a Zionist passes by, and he argues with me about Gaza and Auschwitz. So I tell him, you know, does Gaza have gas? I give him an example. Does Gaza have medical experimentation? I give him an example. I just seen two naked bodies of Palestinian youth 
all stitched up because their inner organs had been stolen. <coughs> Everything I told, he said, I said, yes, they do in Gaza. Finally, he couldn't stand anymore. He said, you're an idiot, and he walked away. So, uh, I have a, a lot of political posters uh, sympathetic to uh, uh, the left also, in, and to working class, uh, and to unions as well. So, any other questions? Uh, yeah. بين الانتفاضه وهلا قديش صار 15 سنه هدول نقطة بالتاريخ واكيد في تاثير تاثير الفن الاسلامي والعربي موجود بكل العالم اكيد فبس انا عم بحكي عن الانتفاضه بدك افرجيك كيف فن الانتفاضه اثر على بقيه الدنيا لهالدرجه بعرفش ما عملت هذا البحث لسه بس 15 سنه مرقين من وقت 95 لهلا اكثر 23 سنه انا عم بعطيكي شيء اهم بعطيكي سوري ام باك ان عربي ام جيفينج يو سمثينج فار مور امبورتنت يو ونت تو سي هاو سليمان منصور انفلونسد ان امريكان بينتر رايت از ذات وات يو ونت تو سي نو وات دو يو ونت تو سي كيف احنا من على فلسطينيين I'm back to Arabic. This also is a challenge to you. Or go study Dar Yassin. Go write, go make books and go write articles. Send them to China, to India, to the, to Russia, and tell them what's happening here. Uh, but I can't do it all. So that's your responsibility. And that's why I did the Kafir Qasim book, to tell young artists uh, it's time you start digging into our history and putting it uh, as clearly and as honestly into book form, writing about it, article form. Uh, you guys are also good in social media. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> you can put it on Facebook. Go ahead. Uh, Okay. يمكن كمان سؤالك علا هو مش بس انه كيف احنا من اكثر عباء العالم، كمان كيف عمان ايش هدفنا بالفن المعاصر او بالفن بشكل عام؟ هل احنا هدفنا انه ناثر على العالم الخارجي؟ هل احنا هدفنا كحركه فنيه؟ ولا هدفنا كمان انه ناثر على العالم الخارج كحركه
So my, just very quickly, I want to summarize for those who are not understanding Arabic, because I feel like the, the question that Paula asked about where is the where is the influence of our art onto the Western world or onto the uh, international world, perhaps it is indeed, as Sanya said, that it's much too early to note that, but maybe it all comes back to what is our um, aim. Uh, do we want to influence in terms of an artistic movement? Do we want to influence in terms of uh, uh, you know, movement that relates what's happening in Palestine. So, and uh, and then my last question is, what, you know, how are the materials? How are the artists, and how are artists working in materials? Well, first of all, you reminded me that actually I gave Ola and Sala. I gave you the wrong answer. I, that's not what I really believe. What I really believe is that there's a class society worldwide, and if uh, uh, we do not want we cannot influence the West. They do not want to be influenced by us. The West that is ruling class. You cannot influence them. They, are, they control propaganda and they want to influence you and they want to put in your head ideas that are backward about, about I'm different, my, I'm self-expression, my painting is about how I feel inside me, uh, inner necessity, all of that what I call crap, all of that propaganda. Uh, there's no way you're going to make that propaganda with the billions upon billions upon billions they spend to keep you thinking that you are a subcategory or lesser, that you're going to influence the art that they promote. It doesn't mean that there isn't another art taking place that is more revolutionary and more advanced. Uh, if you look at artists of the Soviet uh, revolution, you will see that the importance is not given to Mojevich, but to Kandinsky, because Kandinsky was an elitist. He believed that one person was the head of the triangle, the elite, and all of us are uh, slaves under that elite. That artist is very heavily collected by the Guggenheim. Uh, the art of Mojevich and others of that period is not that they, they save it, they put it in their uh, basement, they hide it, they take care of it, like they do to African art. But then they go to Africa and kill Africans. So uh, what you're asking is for us to change the, uh, at, uh, the propaganda of the bourgeoisie. Forget it. We don't want to change it, you know? We want to put it down completely. Oh, I didn't answer your question. During the Intifada, there was a period when they decided they are going to boycott Israeli art supplies. And that's when they started using natural supplies. One of them was Nabil Anani, who went and got um, a bunch of leather from uh, Al Khalil, where they make shoes, and he didn't know how to use it. And he tells a funny story of how he brought it home, and it started stinking. Etc. And he had to, there were small pieces, so that piece I showed with leather was made at the time they were boycotting materials. Simon Mansour, all, they all boycotted. Uh, uh, Taysir Barakat, who is very important among them, I'm sorry I didn't show all of them, uh, started using henna and other natural materials to dye his work, and eventually he was burning wood, uh, which is a method of making art that is known and that the materials they used uh, during that period were interesting because they were trying to boycott Israeli products. Did I answer? Okay. Yeah. Um, my question is in two parts. Uh, first, I was wondering if you could elaborate why you chose um, other uh, artistic media like video art or installation art or uh, performative art. Um, whether these, uh, these types of uh, art uh, have echoes uh, that resemble what uh, we have in the social, co in the content of uh, the art you just discussed. That's one part. You have two part questions? Uh, no, no, no. The first okay. one was whether you can elaborate why you chose some of it. 
I, I, my expert, I'm a painter, my expertise is in painting. Yeah. So, and I'm not an admirer of, or a lover of uh, installation art or mixed media. Uh, and, and much of it, uh, and, and by the way, during the periods I discussed, they, were, it, they did not use that media. Um, uh, but I have not, no objection to filmmaking. Palestinian filmmaking is not mixed media. And nor do I object to mixed media. What I object to in installation and mixed media is the ideology of postmodernism. If you pay attention to exactly who, what the critics are saying, what the thinkers are saying, you take note that it is anti-working class, anti-revolutionary. But it becomes beautiful when our own revolutionary artists use that media and put their own subject matter in it. So I've seen some beautiful installation art done by artists <coughs> who just want to put what's in their heart about the, uh, the uh, politics around here, and, and they change the intention. Mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot disregard painting, and my expertise in painting, and that period was in <coughs> painting. And I think scholarship has to be scientific and thoughtful. I can't wander all over the map and give you something genuine and substantial. You can go check what I said. You might find things that are incorrect, but you won't be able to uh, details that are incorrect. You might have another philosophical idea. If you're a member of the bourgeoisie, you might have all kinds of insults for this art. It's too political, it's too this and that. They have all, I can't remember the words they use because basically I love the art. So uh, the, the thing is, uh, scholarship has to be uh, honest, scientific, and narrow enough so you can deal with it. There's a lot of information out there. I interviewed 66 artists. Uh, I didn't bring this out of a magic bag. So they told me what was going on. And uh, Ismail Shamut was amazing. I didn't present anything of his work. Uh, I think Ismail Shamut for just the history of telling people here, when he did his first show in the 50s in Gaza, I think every member of every refugee camp came to the show. They couldn't believe their eyes. Here, someone had painted what they just experienced in the march through the wilderness. And uh, it, Ismail was a changed man after that. He never never forgot that. Every time he, he became beloved of the refugee camps. He could be sitting on a chair outside and children and people would come out and greet him. In Amman he was always recognized. He was a popular hero. And, and what he did at that time, you know, uh, was very important. Thank you.